so there's usually like okay there's maybe like two artists that i would bone just off of attractiveness that are men okay (laughs) okay um one of them is um bjork bjork's ex-husband matthew barney okay and to be fair he used to be a model he is a pretty man the other one is jeff coons like current jeff coons or i'm I'm gonna say like 80s jeff coons when he had that like american psycho like hot 80s executive thing going on okay but if he's in the 80s then you have to adopt 80s hair i don't care i'm halfway there yeah you can't argue with me just keep keep staring off into space all cute like the bras i'm just gonna say it was like a 70s hold back and burn them and don't have any left um all right yeah so i uh yeah so today's podcast was actually a request by several people and uh it's jeff coons thank you for requesting jeff coons yeah i have a list we try to get to them it's sometimes we have our own loopy ideas sometimes it just takes a while to research Uh, um i'm just saying yeah so I didn't give Katie a solid outline this time. She just kind of, she just saw all of the images that is like the full collection of Coons's work. And uh, yeah, I'm sure she's spinning. She's spinning. I don't know. I don't My brain know. is broken. Yeah. I'm sorry. And I will give a warning because we're doing a survey of Coons's work. And if any of these particularly fascinate you, we can focus on one of his periods He's in his 60s, so he's had quite a while to make art, and he became very famous fairly young, so this is a huge body of work. If you want us to focus on one of them more, just be like, hey, I want to hear more about those celebrations slash balloon animals. And we'll try to cover that, but... (laughs) You heard her right, there were balloon animals. There's balloon animals, and... There is going to be adult content. We will try to be mature about it, but no promises because... It has been a while since we've recorded last, so the longer we go in between recordings, the worse it gets between us. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Koons has eight kids. One by Chichalina. I I don't know where the other one came from, but they said eight in the documentary, and then like six by his current wife. It's... It's it's a uterus. It's not a revolving door. I you know. Whew. I mean, to each their own. But but one of the things about Coons is he kind of keeps a childlike wonder wonder through all of this. Um, <clears throat> you know, if we're gonna talk about him as a person, we should probably mention he does. There's a lot of rumors about the dude. He did get an MFA in the late seventies from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Nice. Not to be confused with the Art Institute of whatever. Those are a scam. The School of the Art Institute of Chicago is a very good school. Yes. And uh, after his MFA, when he the bunny piece with the flower that we're looking at here, and it's an inflatable bunny, it's pink, it's uh, got these very long pronounced ears that are almost as long as its body, and it's holding a carrot up. Next to it is an inflatable white flower with an orange center and a green body. These two inflatable pieces are standing on top of mirrors. And for Coons, these early pieces are about immortality. He breathes into them and he preserves his life through this thing that also gains life through being breathed into. And it also harkens back to like, you know, he was born in York, Pennsylvania. He was a kid in the 50s that like, idealized Americana that was the first generation that was really advertised to and was the first generation that kind of defined how modern quote 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 America is supposed to be viewed what do you think of that yes (laughs) (laughs) so this transitions into the next piece which is four vacuum cleaners they're stacked on top of each other i should mention at this point his father owned a uh, store and he was an interior designer so coons was always 
immersed in commerciality and so this kind of harkens to store displays there's lights underneath the vacuums that are those fluorescent lights that light up with that real fake white light and he refers to these vacuums as virgins they have never been turned on they have never drawn breath and in this state of like kind of Taoist emptiness by never being used by never being quote broken in they are immortal so you have this like breath thing that continues through a lot of his pieces that if the breath can be held and never exhaled or inhaled it kind of lives forever but buying a bunch of brand new and these were literally these have literally never been turned on uh, vacuum cleaners and like rug shampooers that's really expensive yeah and these are like these plexi cases with the lights custom made very expensive so jeff had been working at the museum of modern art and he goes man i gotta make more money me and my inflatable bow tie because that's what he wore at work are gonna go down and get a job as stockbroker and he sells commodities and stock brokes and day trades and funds his vacuum cleaner art a lot of people think that he doesn't have an mfa that he just was a stockbroker that decided to break into the art world that is not the case he's just that smart that charming and that capable and that fertile <laughs> and he's like six eight kids god <laughs> I'm sorry, I just... Yeah, you, ha you haven't even had half that many. I'm, I'm going to hurt you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's... The, not a lot of artists could go become a stockbroker. No. No, most of them are antisocial as heck. Um, if I have to describe Jeff Koons talking to someone, it's like evil Mr. Rogers. Like, he's very, he's, like, monotone but sweet. And he'll, like, add in these, like, kind of, like, insidious uh, undertones to his work or these, like, very complex philosophical arguments. That personality is kind of also part of Coons' work. I don't think he would have been as successful if he wasn't just as creepy charming. And he does love kids. One of the stories he brings up in one of his documentaries is that um, he heard that Salvador Dali was very approachable. So as a kid living in New York, Pennsylvania, he found out what hotel he was at and called Dali and was like, hey, I'd like to meet you and talk about art. And he went to New York City and he met Dali and they had like a little conversation and he's always tried to be approachable like that. So he does genuinely like kids and he does genuinely want to be an artist that gives. But I also can't stress, this guy is crazy smart. Wow. And the art world doesn't like him partially because he brings that, like, he understands the value of a commodity and he understands the value of advertising and he brings that to his art. And he understands that art is a commodity and the art world doesn't like being faced with that. Even though that's the undertone nobody talks about. Yeah, and that's why the art market tanked alongside banking in the 2008s. Another piece we're going to just mention but kind of scan by is he reproduced these very kitschy liquor bottles out of stainless steel. One of which is a full-length train. Right. Like, this is just the uh, engine that I'm showing Katie, but it's it's pretty impressive. There's like a clown and like a fake like liquor serving piece but it's they're worth a lot of money but the one below it is part of what rocketed jeff coons into um fame and it's why there are some issues of i believe it's art in america that are actually worth a lot of money this is an advertisement it looks like a photo and i mean it is a photo it's a posed photograph with two models in bikinis, one's holding a cake, one's petting a pony who's got its mouth open and is kind of suggestively posed at Coons' crotch, and he's holding flowers, which is... <sighs> holding flowers is a reference to Renaissance art and, like, sexual availability. 
and that they are in a field of blooming flowers with these two sexy women and this in their bikini while he's in ultra his, male yeah. yeah he's in his dark you know one one or two top buttons un, undone shirt and all it really says in the ad across the top in block letter jeff coons so if you don't know what art in america is this is a major art publication if you're a collector if you're an artist if you're a gallery you're going to read this to gain information on what shows are coming up, who's hot. They do take it. Galleries do take out ads to promote their artists. This is the first known instance where an artist takes out an ad to really promote himself and promote himself like a commodity. This made people go, wow, wait, who's... Como se what? Yeah, and then the ones that had heard of Jeff Koons are like, this is a very expensive piece of advertisement. Did the gallery take this out and you know do we want to invest in this right so it worked worked super well um and like i said if you can get one of those i think it's art in america's there's also um uh, there's other magazines that are equally famous i'm just having a brain fart but it, it's very collectible those magazines with his ad in it because that is a piece of artwork and if you're looking for other artists that have done things similar, Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol, people have said it, and I completely agree, if Warhol could have had a child, it would have been Jeff Koons. I can see that. The next series, and this is very large, I took a clip from Google search that I wanted to show Katie. These are basketballs that are suspended in liquid. Um, at the bottom is regular tap water. At the top is distilled water. That Those waters have a fraction of a, like, I forget what the measurement is, but they don't weigh the same. Right. So that suspends a basketball in perfect equilibrium until the waters mix enough that the ball settles. But it takes, like, days. Wow. Um, these were originally shown. There's some that have three balls in them. There's some that have one ball in it. It's your traditional black, um, aquarium with the, like, metal stand. Right. Um, but across from them or in the center of the room, depending on how the gallery shaped, was a raft and an iron lung. So you have this, like, symbol of like sports in america the like american gladiator is the sports star but the iron lung and the raft that seem like they could save you from drowning alongside the ball from being stuck in that suspension between life and death are made out of steel that's painted black so even in coons's words it's like these are the things that seem like they will save you these are the things that will liberate you from this stasis but they're just going to pull you under. They're just going to drown you also. And it still has that element of air and breath. and Yes. And in this case, you never draw that breath that gives you life. It's kind of like Schrodinger's cat stuck between Alive life and, and death dead. inside the box. You don't really know which. And this is where I feel like Coons and Damien Hurst have a lot of dialogue. Hurst is actually one of Coons' biggest collectors which is part of why Hearst is worth so much money. He bought a lot of smart pieces from Coons. Um, and they both have that, like, unsettling tongue-in-cheek appreciation for, like, life, death, and commerciality. And if you're not, if you haven't listened to our Damien Hearst podcast, we have one. He's perhaps most famous for suspending a uh, giant shark in formaldehyde. Oh. Um... <laughs> it's a tiger shark. It, it died naturally, if that makes you feel better. I feel better. Yeah, that was before you were here. The next one is a large uh, Gordon's ad that's... He just reproduced them bigger than live. I just threw that in there to mention them. If you see a retrospective, they're going to be there. For him, he always finds some advertising thing in them that means Jeff Koons. Because he felt like, especially at this point... That he was looking for the new, and that the new is what people are constantly striving for, and so the new is what you're selling. The next three pieces we're going to talk about are 
giant figurines cast in bisque and this is done by katie's looking at me funny do you want to explain why bisque is a weird choice no no go ahead and explain how he did it first well he hired italian artisans to recreate these from photographs or what were actually tabletop kitsch items and you know when we say kitsch we mean like campy goofy crap your grandma owns like those little freaky angel statues that stare at you while you try to sleep oh god the weird figurines where their eyes follow you no matter where you go yep and they're judging you even when grandma's not home and the first one is a couple holding a bunch of blue puppies this one was a very part of a very famous uh copyright suit because he took it off the front of a greeting card and then he ended up having to pay the photographer a bunch of money to use the image the next one is michael jackson cast in bisque in gold and white holding he's holding bubbles the monkey right this very like rococo feeling because it really is just his his clothes are gold and white i think saying rococo or baroque and those like over the top european modes of expressing luxury is important when mentioning coons i could see that yeah also you know when you look at bisque porcelain that is the material of ridiculous campy items and i included this third image from the series it's a blonde woman and she's cut off just below her butt her proportions are ridiculous her boobs are way too big her butt's way too big and she's holding a pink panther doll like playfully over her breast she's got on like turquoise pants but like no top it almost looks like she's trying to be a mermaid. Yeah, but Coons falls under a lot of um, criticism for being sexist. And these statues where like women have part of their heads lopped off or women have part of their bodies lopped off is some of that criticism. Some of this dates back to the Surrealists, who that was a very common thing to do to right. like make people feel uneasy. There's an argument for that being linked to the inherent violence towards women in western society i don't feel like that if that plays into coons's work he's aware of it and he's making a comment but i've never been around the dude so i couldn't tell you oh yeah he's sexist or something it could just be that he likes to harken back to those times when women were portrayed like that yeah i mean he's He has always very much celebrated the fact that he is part of, once again, that, like, nostalgic 50s childhood. He speaks of his childhood as this, like, golden perfect past, which nobody has. Right. So I think that's part of the mythology that Coons has adapted for himself. And this really comes to a head in the next piece that we're going to talk about, which is the X-rated one, which is called Made in Heaven. It just, yeah, Katie's circling it with her finger. and That one. That one, yeah. This is one of the uh, less raunchy photos that I gave you. Um, Coons, once again, married a porn star, an Italian porn star named Cicciolina. I, I forget what her actual name is, but her porn name was Cicciolina, and it's just easier to remember. Uh, they decided to embrace a Rococo lifestyle. So you were accurate in surmising that. Oh, look, my art history degree paid off. Finally. <laughs> and uh, make a movie together. But what kind of movie would they make, Katie? Well, um, um, I'm going to go with young child educational. Uh, do you want to try again? Um... I'm going to go with 80s buddy cop style. Uh, nope, nope. It's porn. Suppo- porn. Porn. Made in Heaven was supposed to be the internet the ma- is for porn. <laughs> the internet is for porn. porn. It was supposed to be their like movie that they made together. The movie has never been released if it even exists at all. Okay. What does exist are... The main one that everybody knows is this big, it was a billboard and also a large blown up photograph, like the advertising piece we briefly mentioned before for Gordon's Liquor. 
it's Chichalina draped over a rock, her like bleach blonde hair flying back, her red lips highlighted, her breasts that are just barely covered with lingerie perking up and coons laying over her like the dominant alpha male. With her like stocking clad legs wrapped around him in her black high heels, high That's the statue. heels. I'm talking about the picture behind the statue. Oh, okay. But yeah, but, but but in front of this in this exhibition, um, it's a statue of them boning. Yeah. And it is a hundred percent anatomically correct. And there are several statues like this. There is a bust of coons from the torso up, obviously orgasming. There's one in crystal of them having sex. Like a How acrylic you... crystal. Okay. Yeah. Cast acrylic. And it's larger than life size. Just a little bit larger than life size. All of these that I'm talking about. Um, there's photographs that would fit with a pornography web page. Close-ups of body parts. All of her body parts. Them stimulating those body parts with mouth and appropriate body parts and earlobes yes katie <laughs> yes earlobes are an important part of that and when he would present this piece at museums <laughs> remember that i mentioned that he's like creepy mr rogers well he'd get up there just yeah big smiles big smiles and go through this slideshow and he'd do things and say like this is me penetrating Chichalina from behind. Uh, if you'll notice on her left cheek, on her face, is a pimple. Next slide. <laughs> so it was like this scientific analysis of them boning. And I will say that the statues from this are gorgeous. They are ridiculously Rococo. They reference explicitly older pieces of artwork oh yeah but yeah that was a word from katie's dog she says well, we're gross and need to move on i'm just gonna go with that <laughs> i feel like a voyeur i didn't know I, that i, think I needed that's part this of it. i think that that's part of it but you know he's talking about immortality the space between oh. like life and death and this is human sexuality laid bare it's honest, but at the same time, the honest way that we idealize it. So he's moved from the breath of life to the creation, creation of, of life. life. And yes, he playfully says that when he talks about these pieces. The look on her face is pure horror. I just want you all to know that. I, and it's because I followed his train of thought. I, like, <laughs> it's I don't... not... I know I it's not a bad train of thought, but I am following a modern artist's train of thought, and that disturbs me more than anything. He's still alive. He's a contemporary artist. I'm more disturbed now than I was two seconds ago. Thank you for that. Uh, that's why I'm your friend, just to bother you. But the winters are so cold. The winters are so cold. Carry on. So... And I have to pause here. At the end of the 80s, uh, while this show is touring, Chichalina has a child with him. Um, I don't know why, but she, when the baby's a little, like a couple years old, she leaves him and moves back to Italy and starts her political career and will not let him see the kid. Oh, man. There is a nasty custody fight um it kind of it just breaks his heart from everything i've seen there's even a there is a documentary that goes very in depth onto made in heaven and his next stage but for most of the 90s coons is not really producing artwork he's just trying to he's just trying to get his kid back he does oh. however have this idea for these large what i would call mostly public work pieces and he calls them celebrations Unfortunately, he is becomes such a perfectionist at this point. He always was. Like, if you look at all of these pieces, they are flawless and perfect. 
but he gets even more that way and he actually like bankrupts foundries making the next pieces of work they're mostly in aluminum or highly polished steel with an iodized coating and they are giant balloon animals even this hulk one that is uh the hulk you're looking at which is the hulk pushing a flower cart towards some inflated balloons with an inflated gorilla at the other end those are all cast in steel with iodized coating on the outside holy cow and the balloon animals like if you look at like into the nose of one you can see the twists on the inside where you would have twisted a balloon to close it up wow so and when you're talking about things that weigh like tons and are made out of stainless steel or aluminum that is a lot of money That's, yeah, that's intense. And I do occasionally get asked, "Hey, I saw this giant balloon that looked like a tulip, or I saw this giant balloon dog in a park." It's Jeff Koons. There's no one else that does this. These cost millions of dollars to buy, and I'm gonna guess he's not making a whole lot off the top. Oh yeah, no. But like I said, he's so picky about these. He sent some foundries under. He's still painting. Um, he comes up with like computer sketches with his interns and then makes his interns paint them. Like he has not physically made a piece of artwork since the eighties, at least I'm going to bet the late seventies, like had his hand in like actually crafting it. Holy cow. Well, I mean, how could he do this stuff? This is a extremely specialized skill set. Right. Not everybody's going to have that. Um, and art hasn't always been about that. In the past, we've talked about right. Saul Lewitt, where you buy instructions on how to make it. There's always been the, artists you're training. The steel cube guy. Yeah, who... Donald Judd didn't make his own stuff in the 70s. Right. Um, Renoir had apprentices that painted the bulk of his paintings, and he came in and touched them up. Same thing with Renoir. As far as you go back, apprentices have been involved in the creation of master's works. That's how they learned. Coons is a commercial person. He sells himself like a salesman. And a salesman does not make their own product. That's how I justify that. I think it would make less sense if Coons actually made this stuff. One of the next celebrations I wanted to show you just because this is amazing. It's like a cracked Easter egg, but it's a highly reflected iodized surface. Uh, the inside is like a mirror polished silver. The outside is a mirror polished purple. It's, it's almost like you remember those um, really thin glass Christmas ornaments you used to have back in the 80s and early 90s. And then when you crack the inside, it'd have that silver... That's reflective. probably actually what he's thinking about. Yeah. I think there were Easter decorations like that too. I right. could be off. But I've it's a broke... great thing to give your kids something that breaks super easy. Yeah, I've broken it off at all. Um <laughs> also that's the second time that I've been on his train of thought and I am Well and like, you know, we were talking about life and creation, the childish wonder that goes with advertising and easily recognizable products. What is more recognizable than a frickin' Easter egg? Especially a giant one that, like, you or I could crawl into. Like, it probably would come up to my waist, and I'm five foot four. Okay. <clears throat> Katie's excited about the next picture. Do you want to describe it? It's, it's... It's a puppy. It's a puppy. It looks like a, a Karen Terrier. If you're a Karen Terrier, we're like Toto, six... Toto from The Wizard of Oz was a Karen Terrier. Oh, I love Karen Terriers. They're adorable. Um, so yeah, if your puppy is like six feet, six stories tall. Yeah, I think it's three stories tall. Well, there's a house right here with like three windows. Oh, okay, four. Yeah, six. Jeez. I and, forget how big this thing is, but it is giant. It's made of it, flowers. It, it's But it looks like a patchwork quilt. Yep. So it's uh, it's giant. It is a giant patchwork quilt toto. And, by, and it's got those like muted like dark crimson dark blue this like mustardy I, yellow i will say the flowers on it constantly change right and where you put it it really affects how it looks 
Coons couldn't get into a famous German art fair. So he parked this outside of it. (laughs) And more people showed up to see the puppy than they did the art fair. (laughs) And the puppy has toured all over the world. I think it's still touring. I'm sure you can look up on his webpage if it is where it's at. Um, It's the closest he's ever gotten to an environmental piece. I mean, the celebrations, the large-scale inflated works... Those are out in the public. That's why I call them public works. I mean, not a lot of people can pay for them. Right. Um, so, yeah, the puppy. I have I had a friend in grad school who was like, I became a painter. So my mom took me to Spain. And the puppy was there when we were in Madrid. And I didn't give a crap about anything else I saw. I wanted to know what was up with that puppy. And she even had a like stuffed puppy that they would sell near where they were at. Cause Coons Aww. will make a buck. He doesn't right. care. They're, one of his famous pieces is the inflatable bunny from earlier, but cast in stainless steel with like no features. And for a while you could buy them as necklaces. And I always kicked myself in the butt. Cause that's going to be a piece of jewelry that actually really accrues in value. And I think it was only like, $500 at the time. I know I'm saying only $500, but yeah, that's going to go up. I bet they're worth triple that now. They were in limited edition. And I've limited edition is like so Franklin Mint, so Jeff Coons. He nailed commercialization. Didn't yeah, he? he's no, like he's like really, brilliant. Yeah, it's this... disturbing, but brilliant. Yes, disturbing, but brilliant. <laughs> Can and we, I think that that is today's podcast name. I think he would like high five you for saying that and then have some like thing he read by Kierkegaard to expound on why he's like that. But, you know, and we're talking about these celebration, these giant balloon animals. He's once again, like permanently preserved the breath. The act of inflating those things, the breath that went into that is immortal. Because it's stainless steel. Like a lot of people point out, a Jeff Koons piece is going to outlast everyone. So we're going to talk about some of his more contemporary ones. And I'm really proud of us because I figured this podcast would take a whole lot longer. Wow. And that's with you yelling at your child midway through. Nice. Katie's kid was bad. Um, (laughs) So. I I just. Okay, look. Before we end this podcast, I feel like Jeff Koons is the only modern artist so far that I really want to meet. I know, right? Like, and it's not just because I totally bone him. <laughs> My husband, if he ever listens to this, it's going to be like, you can cheat on me with Jeff Koons. It's going to be like, yes, husband. We're <laughs> best friends and we are going to do it tomorrow. Uh, and Jeff Coons, if you're listening, we'd love to interview you. Oh, yes, please. Pro- I promise not to hit on you like a creepy weirdo. Probably from afar. You probably want to call in. Also, if you would, like, actually sign the restraining order for me so I can touch your signature, that would be great. I'll notarize it for you. <laughs> Hell, I'll be a witness. <laughs> That's what friendship is. Notarizing the restraining order against your friend for the person they're stalking. She's just keeping me out of trouble. No, I'm not stalking Jeff Coons. Oh my god. I've got too Yet. many things to do. <laughs> Jeff Coons will totally buy you some ice cold milk and some Oreo cookies. If you come on our show. Yeah. Otherwise, milk and cookies are out, sir. Sir, we're not. If, you don't, if you're not on the show, no. We're just... <laughs> All right. So his contemporary pieces. More contemporary pieces. And this is some of... The one we're about to mention is one of the ones that called him a misogynist again. I kind of feel like he's just taken that and rolled with it because the male gaze is defined art forever and you can't have a dialogue about any art ever and not know that it's primarily dudes picking what everybody else sees. Jeff, I want to believe in you. I want to believe you're not a sexist prick. I feel the angst just radiating (laughs) off of you. So 
it's that iodized like aluminum steel again i'm not sure what the one we're looking at specifically is made out of it's in a i would call this a teal it's turquoisey teal like kind of in between the two i i'll back you on that it is set up like a classical greek sculpture where the figure is leaning against a post for support even though with steel you wouldn't have to do that but with marble you have to do that because it's so frail um the woman is naked from the right breast down because she's pulling her dress up over her head and uh on the pedestal next to her that's draped with uh fabric is a iodized steel planter's pot and a flower growing in it so this references his celebrations the balloon animals this references the puppy and this references his earlier bisque pieces and it still has that like over the top advertisey 20th century baroque rococo a go-go right it's the new new a little art nouveau in there just with the way that it has well, art the... nouveau was about organic lines so that makes sense um boom and excess what do you think about this one compared to his others i i see the evolution of his work in this yeah you know it really does tie everything together um you know i I don't know if it's the image that i'm looking at because i obviously this is a 3d piece and i'm looking at a 2d image so i can't get the full effect of it but i don't see i don't see the overt misogyny i can see some covert you know with her head being the way it is and stuff but i don't overtly you know see misogyny in this i just see the like you said the directed male gaze i just think it's interesting that that gets said about these pieces and the earlier bisque ones but it's less talked about with the chicholina stuff i think because she was a willing participant but how much of a willing participant was she because i think he directed okay but w- the, the next, next piece the next the one, ne- is this lady isn't, gaga isn't she a willing participant like she would have to at least sign off on that yeah right? the most recent ones he's been doing and i love 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 these are his mirror balls which brings back once again 1950s pennsylvania lawn art kitsch Right, yeah, now we're now we're in the outside, but we still have that, you know, to make these mirror balls, you still have that breath of life. Yeah, that. and you've seen yourself in all of these pieces. You are a reflected part of the sculptures. This just pulls you into these. Uh, the Lady Gaga one, she's propping her back up with her arms. She has on a long wig and her legs are spread apart. You know, she's sitting on her butt, like holding herself up. Um, she's completely nude, and the mirror ball is located between her legs. The her statue of Gaga, huh? Sorry. Yeah, her hair is covering her boobs, like Lady Godiva. Lady Godiva. That's what I was trying to think of. It was like chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. The chocolate company. <laughs> oh my god! I, I, want I saw that little bit of drool coming out. Of <sighs> <laughs> Vanessa likes food. That's why she has a Jello roll. But the Lady Gaga statue, she is like porcelain white. And I'm not sure on the materials for this one, but it's either a powdered covering over a steel or he's gone back to bisque. And the mirror ball is bright blue. He's also started sticking them in front of or as part of famous paintings, which actually references back to Delacroix who painted a famous painting of the French Revolution where France is a woman with, like, the breast ripped Mm. off of her shirt and her hair streaming out, and she's leading men into battle. The reason this is related, when that piece was originally shown, a mirror, a full-length mirror, was propped up in front of the painting, which the figures are all basically life-sized, to invite the viewer, the potential revolutionary, to look into the mirror and see themselves as part of the battle for French independence. Huh. So when he includes this mirror ball in paintings and in classical sculpture, there is a precedent. This is an intelligent, I feel like comment on commercial society, commerciality, the immortality of art and art history. He is inviting you by seeing your reflection in the mirror ball to become immersed with the statue. You're being 
drawn uh, into it. You're ascending into Gaga. It also does look like a lawn ornament. I mean, for th- for the lay viewer who is not going to sit there and get all those layers, it looks like a yeah, and that's fine. I mean, it is. It is right. supposed to look like that. And if that's all you get, that's cool. Um, and the last one I included is another one in the Mirror Ball series. It is Ariadne uh, laying down in the Mirror Balls posed on her hip. She has what's called wet drapery over her body, which is what it sounds like. It's like wet cloth. Like she got in a wet t-shirt contest, but she's wearing a toga. A full-length dress. Yeah, right. a toga. That's that's what they wore back in the old days with the stuff and the things and the people. I, and the I occasionally put in good comments. You're, you're smarts. You're smarts. Um, a wet drapery is the stage before female sculpture is allowed to be full nude in Greek art. There were a lot of wet t-shirt contests. In Greek art, there was a lot of dong. Dong for miles. It's like the opposite of Game of Thrones. No titties. No bush. Dong for miles. I feel like this is Greece. No titties. No bush. Dong for miles. And uh, there's some philosophy majors that are about to bust me in the lip. No. Dong for miles. <laughs> Get yourself under control, Katie. A professional adult. What would Nietzsche think of this? What would Nietzsche think of this? Oh, we'll explain that some other time. Anyway. <laughs> so wet drapery is the stage before women in Greek art have permission to be fully naked. Guys, Katie's over here, like, bent over, turning red, and about to die. I might have to... I'll let the CPR be on the show. It'll be great. So Ariadne is reclining on... It's probably a a sete. This is a very... If you Google Ariadne, this is going to show up as the position she's in. The ball's situated on her hip. Um, If you listen to our Surrealist podcast, uh, she shows up in a lot of Dekirico work because she's like a doorway between the dream state right. and reality so once again very smart art history reference coons knows his stuff i encourage you to watch the documentaries that are about him on netflix if you want to know more not netflix youtube so they're free <laughs> well since he's here you want to get a cute kid reaction we can giant balloon animal yeah hey little guy how old are you Four. 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 Four years old. What do you think of this statue of a giant balloon animal? Um. Would you like to see that? Yeah. Yeah, would you like to touch it? Yeah. If you could own that, would you own it? Yeah. How yeah. big do you think it is? Um, like giant. Like giant? Like giant. Yeah, do you see that grown man standing next to it? Yeah. Does it, it make it cooler that it's really big? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's really, really big. All right. Thanks, little man. Give yeah, me you were awesome. Appreciate it. All right. Go. If you're going to go play outside, get your shoes. I have my <sighs> All right. So this has been an episode of <laughs> art. I swear. Thank you for listening. Adorable four-year-old. Um, <laughs> after some really appropriate comments. <laughs> Welcome to adult life. Uh, I'm Vanessa Van Alstein. I'm Katie Gibbs. Thank you to the Iridial Project. Thank you to Joe Gibbs for the intro outro. Have a creative day. Bye. Bye.